Welcome everybody to the second day of this uh, symposium. Uh, I'm Catherine Mevel from IPGP and I will be chairing uh, this morning session. And I will give the floor to Luce Fletou, who will talk about uh, interplate deformation, short versus long tail scales. Luce. So thank you to the organizers of this nice meeting and also thank you to the numerous collaborators with whom I worked during the last years. And we saw yesterday how plate tectonics was discovered, and plate tectonics at the beginning was describing the rotation of rigid plates. Then tectonic zones of more diffuse plastic deformation have been identified. Now we have very precise modern measurements of the deformation within the plates. We can measure velocities uh, with, uh, at the scale of a millimeter per year, and there are still deformations inside what can be named stable plate interiors. And this is mainly what I will talk about today. And the question is, what is the origin of those deformations within stable plate interiors? And perhaps it's just slow, viscous of, or plastic deformation of the lithosphere. And if this is the case, this is interesting because these deformations reflect the state of stress inside the plate. The, the strain rate is just proportional to the stress. But what about if it is elastic deformation? The plates, like any object, like this table here, are not... Uh, are not rigid, they are at least elastic. And if the forces, if the, the stresses applied on the boundaries of this object are time dependent, then this object will also deform. And we can think about various mechanisms which can induce variations of the forces applied on the plates. It can be large earthquakes, mega earthquakes, which suddenly induce big changes at the plate boundary. It can be the loads on the Earth, first due to, to the glaciations uh, during the last uh, 20,000 years, and we can still see the effect today. And we can see, think also about present-day variations of loads on the Earth, we know that both hydrology and melting of ice sheets exert loads on the plates. And then can, there can be some more smaller type of strains linked to deformations in the top layers of the plates. For example, internal strains linked to temperature variations or pressure variations within the aquifers, and those are within the few meters or the few top kilometer of the surface of the Earth. So we'll try to think essentially whether those elastic deformations can be important and how they can alter slightly perhaps our vision of what plate deformation and plate velocities are. And first, let us look at uh, plate, velo plate velocities inside plates, uh, not after a big earthquake, but before two big earthquakes, one which is here. Um, this is uh, Sumatra, and you know there has been in 2004 the big uh, Aceh earthquake. And those are the velocities in the area before the earthquake, and those velocities here are plotted with respect to South China, which is here. And what you see here, it is that you have not only very close to the subduction zone, but further north, you have velocities going upward towards China. And the way to interpret that at that time, the natural way was to say, okay, you, there are upward velocities there, and one knows that there has been a geologically active zone around here near the Red River, so there must be 
a Sunda plate here moving to, towards China. And this represents the velocity of the Sunda microplate with respect to China. And those are the velocities in the South America, in the south of South America. This is the area where the Mole earthquake after took place. And this is the area where the Valvidia earthquake took place in the 60s. And you see that far away, this is in, near Buenos Aires, and you see that you have perturbations of the velocities. Here it's with respect to a South American plate velocity defined with respect to, to the western part of Brasilia here. And you see that in the southern part, you, you see velocities going towards the trench, and here you see velocities going away from the trench. Now, the two earthquakes occurred, and what occurs then? You see the velocities going exactly in the opposite direction. You see here the velocities, in fact, those are differences between the velocities before and after, but those velocities are much larger in magnitude compared to the velo velocities before the earthquake, and you see that they go towards the southwest in all the Sunda plate here, and that here in the area of Mole, they go, of course, towards the trench. And in fact, those mega earthquakes which occurred during the last 15 years, it, it is the first really big earthquake near the 60s, and it is the first time that we can measure precisely the deformation that they induce. And this can be, they can bring really interesting data about the deformation of the asthenosphere and also about, in fact, the, the strains in the plates. And, okay, I talked about um, uh, Sumatra and Mole, but of course there is the same thing for Japan. There has been a question yesterday about the compression in the Japan Sea, but indeed before the Toku earthquake, the velocities here on the western part of Japan was going towards China and Russia, and uh, after, in fact, the earthquake, in fact, the Japan Sea is in extension, the velocity here in the, goes westward with respect to, um, to China. And so, what, does, what can we learn, in fact, from this change of deformation far away from the earthquakes? With, for the three mega earthquakes, we obtained a very similar type of deformation. And I will just mention here essentially the, the, the main feature. First, one must keep in mind that if that the deformation, the post-seismic deformation, if one non-dimensionalizes it with respect to the co-seismic, it becomes larger and larger when one goes far away from the trench. Here you see data in Japan, the curves here, it is close to the trench, it is the points here, the closest to the trench, and the little dots here, it is points which are in China or in Korea. And so this process of post-seismic deformation, it induces deformations which are not at all proportional to the co-seismic deformation, so it has not the same origin, it cannot be slip, which continues on the subduction plane. And one thing which is interesting, in fact, you see here the amplitude of post-seismic deformation as a function of distance to the trench, and you see that after something like 1,000 kilometers, the curve levels off, and we'll interpret that later on the fact that it indicates a thin lithosphere because if you add a low viscosity in the whole lithosphere, the curve will continue all straight. And 
Also, one thing which is quite remarkable that we saw in a previous slide, it is that even 50 years after the Valvidia earthquake, one still sees signs of the post-seismic deformation of the post-seismic velocities. And so we try to understand uh, what is going on with models of viscoelastic deformation. And Roland Bergman, in fact, showed such type of models yesterday. And there has been work on this type of phenomenon by Elsasser and by Politz, Roland, Barbara, quite a long time ago. And because of these big earthquakes, which occurred recently, we have new data about that. And we try to understand how it can help us to, to un understand the far field deformations. And to do that, we'll do, like Roland Bergman explained yesterday, uh, viscoelastic models of deformation. Because we are here interested in far field deformation, we have to mesh the Earth on a huge area, some 4,000 kilometers away from the earthquake zone and down to the core mantle boundary. So there are various finite element meshes. And uh, with viscosities for the three earthquakes of the order of three times, times to the 18 Pascal second, we fit nicely the far field post-seismic velocities. This is the case after Toku earthquake. This is the case after Sumatra earthquake. Now, this viscosity of three times 10 to the 18 Pascal second, this was the meaning of my question yesterday. Because of my old experience of convection bringing heat at the base of the plate, I tend to interpret it as a transient viscosity, not as a long-term viscosity because uh, I find difficult to explain the thickening of the, pla of the oceanic plates if you add such a low viscosity at the base of the plates. <coughs> it would induce too much heat flow at the base of the plates. Now, what does it tell us about the strains after and <coughs> And before the earthquakes, we try to understand this with simple here 2D models, where we have a slab plunging inside the mantle, and we have here a seismic zone. And this is a very simple toy model where we make regular earthquakes and we compute, we have velocities which correspond to the average velocities of the earthquakes there. And we just try to understand what are the velocities compared to the average velocity in both plates in this simple system. And what you see here, in fact, it is what would be the velocity compared to the regular average velocity if you had no earthquake at a distance of 700 kilometers, that is what I name in the far field. And this pink curve here, it would be the case if you had no asthenosphere, you would get no post-seismic signal, but simply the co-seismic signal would be compensated regularly through the whole end of the seismic cycle. This is a very common type of model, named, in fact, the elastic backslip type of model. Now, as you have a, a softer and a softer lithosphere, you get more of post-seismic deformation, and you get also an, a deformation, but in the opposite direction, at the end of the seismic cycle, which is much larger, it is what you see on those curves here. The blue or the red curve have velocities at the end of the seismic cycle much larger than the velocity for the elastic backslip model. And now what you see here, it is the response of one of the models, one which has a relatively large viscosity, 
so the viscous effect is not very large, but you see it as a function of distance to the trench. And when you are close to the trench, the full lines, in fact, are elastic, uh, the full lines are viscous models, and the dashed lines are elastic models. When you are close to the trench, in fact, the, the effect of the viscosity of the asthenosphere is not very big compared to the purely elastic model. But far away from the trench, relatively, it becomes more, much and much bigger. Now, how do we apply that, in fact, to what we saw on the first slide? OK, this is, again, the Sunda area. And if we apply this model, which is perhaps a somewhat oversimplified model, but if one uses the type of viscosity, burger viscosity with three times 10 to the 18 pascal second in the asthenosphere, and if one computes, in fact, the velocities in the far field, one gets here the red or the blue curve, while the backslip elastic model would give the black curve here. And so our claim here is that all those vis velocities of the Sunda in quote plate with respect to South China, they might very well be just an effect of the interseismic uh, velocity um, of the interseismic signal. And one could um, one could say the same thing about uh, South America, those velocities are most certainly a sign, just a sign of interseismic velocities, and the whole South American er area, the whole western part of South America is certainly polluted at all time by, by the large earthquakes on its boundaries. Now, a second uh, phenomenon Post-glacial rebound, we heard about it yesterday. And post-glacial rebound is known for its vertical velocities, which are conspicuous. And on the other end, it is the velocities in uh, United States out of the tectonic areas is um, quite uniform. And this is what you see here, the horizontal velocity. Uh, if you try to, to, to search for the best field rotation pole for South America, you find, for, for this area here, you find very little residual velocities. And this has been done more recently, in fact, with more recent GPS data, and one arrives at the same conclusion. Those are residual velocities in the North American plate once one searches for the best rotation poles for the stations which are in this area here. Now, there is a, so the, the usual tendency is to say, OK, the, the pole for the North American plate, it has to be computed using, in fact, the GPS stations which are in this area. There is a little problem with this interpretation. And the problem is that the boundary between North America and Eurasia in fact, is in this area here of Eastern Asia. And there is an area of extensional earthquakes and an area of compressional earthquakes. And obviously, the rotational pole has to be close to the transition between extension and compression. And there is um, a purple star here, which is a pole which has been deduced quite many years ago based on earthquake evidence there, the pole of rotation between those plates. And the old GPS poles were quite in agreement with this uh, Cook et al. pole, but the new GPS data are not at all in agreement with this pole. Those are GPS data with, data with respect to the recent uh, ITRF models. And so now, Rather than saying, OK, we really think that the western, that the eastern part of the United States is a stable area, we will rather use uh, post glacial rebound models and try to correct the GPS velocities 
through the whole North America using those post-glacial rebound models. And post-glacial rebound has been studied for more than 50 years, and there has been a variety of models which all provide an adequate um, fit to the, verti to the vertical velocities uh, and to also to the, pa to the paleo uplift uh, me me measured, for example, in Canada. And for example, this type of model here is the type of model VM2, which was used with ICE5G until not very long ago, until the publication of ICE6G. It's a model with a small increase of viscosity in the lower mantle. Now, the new model proposed by Argus and Pelletier, in fact, it has a similar type of, vis of viscosity, but they added a small, thin layer here at the base of the lithosphere, which represents the viscous part of the lithosphere. And we will try several other models. We'll try a model like this one, but with a high viscosity, lower mantle, but a Maxwell rheology. And we have tried also models here, like this one here, with a high viscosity, lower mantle, but a burger rheology, and with or without here, this little layer at the base of the lithosphere. And now, among those models, some provide, what, what we try to do with all these models, it is to try to see whether they provide a good fit to the internal deformation with, within the plates. Once we have the, the deformation within the plates, we correct for the GPS, for the deformations induced by GIA, and we compute a new pole of rotation of North America with respect to Eurasia. And some models give a relatively bad fit for both reducing the internal deformation within the plates and for giving a pole of rotation close to the observed pole. For example, you will see the response of this model here. And some other models give a good fit, it will be typically this model, or a model of that type with viscosity somewhat readjusted. And so this is a case of bad model. And uh, you see here that uh, so, so, so there are a lot of residual velocities, and you can remember this number, for example, here, it's a fit to horizontal velocities in both uh, North America and Eurasia, and this is the Berger model, the one which was on the left, and this one gives a much reduced uh, misfit to the residual velocities, uh, and there is some residuals here, but we know that there are other things going on in Greenland nowadays, and what is remarkable it is that the models which give the lowest residual velocities, they also provide the best fit to the pole of rotation. And so, in fact, there are several classes of model which provide simultaneously good fit to residual velocities and, uh, and good poles of rotation. But those models, they induce millimetric types of deformations all over in the world, not only in the North American plate, but also some deformation in South America, some deformation in, in Africa. So if one tries to, to fit within a millimeter per year the plate velocities, this has to be taken into account. Now, there are deformations also provided by present-day hydrological loads as measured by the GRACE mission. Here you have annual amplitude, and here you have a trend also polluted by uh, GIA earthquakes. And what I want to say about this present-day loads, it is that one understands very well the annual signal, and one obtains a good fit to this annual signal as long as one takes an elastic model. Uh, uh, any effect of viscoelasticity 
or of fast phase transformations uh, in the mantle on an annual time scale would be seen, in fact, on this model, and uh, we, we don't see that at all. These models are perfectly fit by elastic models. But now, if one tries to understand whether they can make velocity perturbations at the time scale where we have GPS measurements, they can do some around the areas where ice sheet melt, but the effect will be very small, quite sm very small in areas where we have uh, hydrological effects like the Caspian Sea or places like that. And then the last effect is linked to internal strains in the top layers, linked to temperature variations in the top few meters or to the pore pressure increasing inside aquifers. These are very shallow layers, but these internal strains can induce deformations much deeper. And all what I want to say about that, it is that unlike load or GIA, for loads, if one takes simple models with uniform mechanical properties, the displacement is proportional to the wavelengths, and then the stress is independent of wavelengths. While for those two effects, the displacement is independent of wavelengths and the stress is proportional to one of those wavelengths. So those two effects, they will be important. They will be important to induce stresses, but they will induce velocities, velocity perturbations, mainly uh, at short wavelengths. Typically, they will induce noise in the GPS data. So, this is a summary of what we saw here, and uh, there are mega earthquakes induce velocity perturbations from centimeters at some few hundred kilometers from the trench to millimeters per year, and the, the perturbation is not only after earthquakes, it's during the whole seismic cycle. GIA induces perturbations of few millimeters per year, Present-day hydrological signal induces smaller uh, decadal type of perturbations except close to ice sheets and the uh, in superficial internal strains induce mainly short wavelengths features. And my conclusion is in fact that, um, okay, we are, I guess there are really strong evidences for uh, elastic deformation of the lithosphere in, in time, and that means that the present day strain rate in the plates cannot, should not be systematically interpreted in terms of forces which drive plate tectonics. I don't mean here that I don't believe that there are areas which have truly uh, long-term um, plastic deformation, but there are also elastic deformation. And also if uh, a geologist and a GPS person are arguing about the deformation in a given area, perhaps they should not argue because they don't necessarily measure the same thing. And um, in those intraplate strains, okay, they, they can produce provide very useful constraints on the mechanical properties of the asthenosphere. We saw that yesterday with Roland Bergman. Uh, it's also using GIA. We get further constraints on the plausible distributions of viscosity in the mantle. And also they can they constrain better hydrological loads. With, and a lot remains to be done for disentangling those various processes and understanding their interaction with intraplate seismicity and plate boundary deformation and seismicity. Thank you.